Does your family at Thanksgiving, um, or the uh, to do the, do they require you to say what you're thankful for before the meal? No, <laughs> no, neither family. My my parents definitely didn't. <laughs> they just said you're ungrateful. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> what What about you? You guys probably have like a séance of some sort, right? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we sacrificed several children at the in the basement of this uh, pizzeria that uh, is uh, nearby. <laughs> I am psyched, because here's the thing. I don't even know where to start, Keith. Uh, whew. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my number one favorite film of all time. Number one favorite film of all time. It is Boogie Nights. Hot bitch. damn. Hot <laughs> damn. <laughs> Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights. Jack Horner has found something special in newcomer Dirk Diggler. <laughs> So let me just pop in this A track and you just give a listen to what you think, okay? Uh I'm gonna I know. I'm gonna let you talk. I'm gonna let you talk. I, I assume I'm not gonna say much for this episode because I know I don't want you to say a word for my episode, yeah. <laughs> for my number one. Yeah, that's fair. So I'm just gonna start off by saying congratulations, your number one film. Tell me why you love it so much, and I'm gonna take a quick nap. Perfect. This is gonna be great. <laughs> It's just the greatest. I, I, uh, Boogie Nights, for those who don't know, uh, came out in 1997. It is written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, who for my money is probably the greatest living director right now. Certainly the greatest Ameri living American film director. Uh, David Fincher's up there in my list too, but Paul Thomas Anderson, this is the film that really put him on the map. It, uh, it stars a young Mark Wahlberg in sort of his early career defining performance as a uh, kid slash young adult who enters the world of pornography in the 1970s in the San Fernando Valley. And it follows his life and his, these, uh, this surrounding cast of characters as they sort of build this pseudo uh, fucked up family within this industry and within this profession. And uh, the highs of the 1970s and the lows of the 1980s. And it's just a, it's just a joy. It is such a, an experience. I can't overstate the impact that this film had on my life. I think that as filmmakers, I would venture to say that most people who love film and who strive to create film, as we both do, probably have a film that they can name that really changed everything for them. And this is mine. I mean, I, I saw this movie the first time when I was 15 or 16. Hola, tapados! And while I loved movies uh, wholeheartedly before, this is the first movie I can remember seeing that totally flipped what I thought movie making could be on its head. Paul Thomas Anderson, is, it's just the biggest flex. It is such a flex of movie making that he's, he's, any idea you have, I mean, the first shot of the film is one of the greatest tracking shots of all time. It's like he, he saw, he heard all this praise being heaped on Goodfellas for that, that shot. And he's like, well, motherfucker, my first shot, my first big movie, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do it better. And he did it better. And it's just this announcement of a genius. And because we know that Paul Thomas Anderson has become this genius, has become a legend, uh, it, it works. It's not like his career failed and sputtered and then he's it's like, oh, that was a big swing and he missed. No, no. He said, I'm fucking dope and I'm here. And we all, Jesus. And then there's a lot of uh, content-wise, it really changed the way I, I saw the world too. So we can get into that as well. Do you like the movie? What do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> the, first, the thing that I kept thinking of the entire film was uh, why, I just kept trying to think of why this is your favorite film. And to me, it boiled down to uh, three things. Well, A, it's about people uh, just astonished at a man's penis size. One. <laughs> Two, free love. Just people banging people. And three, sweet ass karate moves. <laughs> <laughs> and I was yeah. like, wow, that, that's the uh, bingo card for Everett, uh, for reasons why I feel like I can imagine you loving this, this film. Yeah, it really is a culmination of almost all of my favorite things in one film. Yeah. Which is the three things you just said. <laughs> um, 
Uh, the seventies. I've always been fa and fascinated by the seventies. I've I grew up loving funk and disco music. Love that. Uh, as a teenager, I didn't hate pornography. Uh, <laughs> it was it was a subject. Well, what about your feelings now? Where are you? Some interest. We're, we're talking about the past, Keith. It just it just has everything I could want. I I love and, and it's such an interesting study of. Uh, Filmmaking almost. It's like a look behind the curtain at the process of making a film. Yeah. Uh, in obviously a, a different, less conventional way. And 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 Heather Graham gets naked a couple of times. And in 1997, 98, it's a big deal. That was a draw. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I I do. I have a lot of feelings on the film. And again, I don't want to take too much of the airtime, but because uh, oh. you deserve it, uh, rightfully so, for it being your favorite film. I've earned this. Uh, you have, <laughs> you have. <laughs> because again, if you if you utter one word during my episode, I swear to God. Triple stamp, double stamp, Lloyd. You can't triple stamp, double stamp. On this rewatch, this was your second time seeing it. Is that correct? Yes, I had. I rem if I remember correctly, I saw. I didn't see it like in theaters or anything when I was younger. I saw it in chunks. So I don't think I've ever seen it top to bottom mm. all the, the way. The way a from... film should be watched in <laughs> yeah, pieces over I years. <laughs> I saw it over, I, I saw it a lot when it came, n not out, but came out like a, 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 on VHS or whatever, or DVD or whatever it was at that time. VHS this is or... you just saying that you watched the sex scenes. I get it, Keith. It's like, yeah, I've I, I've seen Monsters Ball. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, that's I mean that's that's not true. I I mean I. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what what you want me to do. And your overall impression, without getting into specifics. Mm -hmm. Like, just what do you think when you're done watching it? Do you think mostly you like it, or mostly are you kind of like, what's the point, or what? Just what's your overall impression? My my overall impression. <laughs> This is gonna sound like a negative, and I don't mean it to be, like, at all. This has more to do with my personal taste than it does, like, the, the filmmaking, because we can get into the actual, like, nuts and bolts of the filmmaking. But I watch the film, and after it's over, I go, that was good. And then, like, I, I sort of, like, move on. Like, I didn't dislike it by any means, but I, but I didn't, I wasn't like how you probably connected with it when you were young or whatever, like, I just didn't, I feel like as a whole, we as a society need to have a space for films that are just good, not great, not the best, and not have that be like an insult. We're such a, like a bipolar, uh, it's either the best thing you've ever seen or, or it's the worst thing you've ever seen. And I feel like most films are just pretty good and they're just shades of different gray of good. And I'm sure you feel very differently about this film, but I feel like it's good, and I don't mean that as an insult. I gotcha. I agree with that statement in general. I think we've talked about that, that yeah. everything is an extreme and that's stupid, but I am highly offended that you're bringing that up in the context this. of this film, yeah. you piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess without rambling incessantly, I'll try to summarize what I think is so great. Uh, the, the, two, the two baskets here. is One is from a filmmaking standpoint, I, I kind of went into it, I alluded, that it's Paul Thomas Anderson's first real big movie. He had one before this called Hard Eight, uh, which is a really, uh, it appears to be quite low budget indie film um, starring uh, John C. Riley and Gwyneth Paltrow and Samuel L. Jackson um, and Philip Baker Hall, who's also in, in Boogie Nights. And I think that movie's okay. I just saw it for the first time uh, recently, ra rather recently, and I think it's kind of okay. You can kind of just see that he's working things out. Um, and then Boogie Nights comes, and he, what I'm just, what I'm floored by is A, just the size of this film. The, it, it is, it's not entirely unlike, as I begin to go down this road in my head, the way I was describing, it's completely different subject matter, but the way I was describing Oliver Stone making JFK, where it's like, you, to make this, to, to pitch this movie to a major studio, it says it's about the underbelly of porn production in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it start, I mean, the cast is phenomenal, but it, at that time, I don't think the cast was as phenomenal. I mean, the cast is looking back phenomenal in hindsight because this movie helped make them all such huge stars. Where you go through now and it's every scene, there's another famous face, but they weren't necessarily famous faces in 96, 97 yeah. when this was made. So... To, to just 
to say, I'm going to make this movie where Burt Reynolds is the most famous name. It's got the kid that's doing underwear modeling for Calvin Klein, and it's got a couple other sort of familiar faces in it. It's about porn. It's got a ton of sex in it, and it's three hours long. Like, I just, I, I and I need every pop song from 1975 yeah. to 1983 in it. Like, I just can't imagine. Paul Thomas Anderson was 26 years old, 27 years old when he made this film, and that just blows me away. Um, I think that, like I said, it's just such flexy, fuck you filmmaking in all the best ways, which is just like, I'm gonna do long shots. There's four or five amazingly long takes in this. Um, the opening long take is so iconic because it's out on the billboard in the street and travels into the club and follows them around and uh, introduces a lot of the main characters. And just in that one shot, you, you pick up that uh, Burt Reynolds as Jack Horner is an important guy and that uh, Luis Guzman is sort of a suck up and, and you meet you, John C. Riley's an airhead and Don Cheadle is struggling with his image and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, meet, you learn all this in such minimal dialogue, which is one shot, and it all centers on, ends on Dirk Diggler, Mark Wahlberg. It just, that shot ends on him, because that's where we're going. And I just love everything about that. I love all the musical cues, the, the filmmaking, using music as such a character in the movie is something that I always loved, and even before I knew I wanted to make movies, when I imagined movies in my head, um, I imagined music and how to and how to shape a scene to music. So all the filmmaking stuff is, is one thing. Uh, and then the second thing is just, it, it did change the way I looked at the world for better or worse. I was like saying how happy I was that this movie gave me this whole new perspective on sex and being able to like look at the world. Uh, that it's not necessarily this like taboo crazy, oh my god, don't talk about it, don't be, you know. I love, I love when the scene where Roller Girl and, uh, and Dirk Diggler first hook up on the couch and, and just Burt, Burt Reynolds just sitting there smoking. Like could not, like he's seen this a thousand million times. He's not even, you know? And I remember, I remember being a teenager and thinking like, how, he's just sitting there? He doesn't care? Like, like you know, th this is a huge deal. And so I, I was mentioning to my girlfriend that uh, like this movie really shaped the way like I looked at sex. Like he doesn't have to take it so seriously. And she's like, well, that's not a good way to <laughs> look yeah, at the world. Yeah, I was like, uh, All right, few I'm people not, uh... will respond well to, to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, so. Yes, I can go and go and go uh, about, but we should break it up a little more so I don't just talk for 25 minutes here. Yeah. Um, but the, the movie was hugely influential to, on me as a, as a person, as a young man, as a filmmaker. As I was beginning to think I could try to make films of my own, this movie really, I just love it. It's such a fun celebration of what movie making can be. That's, that's how I would sum it up. Thank you. Let's stay on the filmmaking part of it, because I couldn't agree more. It, it is an A+, plus. W one of the better directed films I think I've ever seen, to be really honest with you. And I, and I was surprised when, as I was watching it. I go, oh, it's very clear and deliberate what we're, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, and it's impressive. It's impressive because I think the direction... I, I was really interested to hear your little synopsis of the film. You know, we, in the beginning, we try and just give a little bit of context. Because as I remember when I was younger, I just, I, I just thought the film was about Dirk Diggler. That, and I feel mm -hmm. like if you just ask people what's Boogie Nights about, I think, oh, it's the story of Dirk, Dirk Diggler, right? And he's a porn star and he's got a big hog, you know, or whatever. And like, that's not the film. Like, that's not what the film is about. He's a part of that story and maybe the, the sort of anchor to it, but that's not what the film is about. And, yeah. and that becomes very, very clear really because of the direction. And the, the shots here are talking about these long takes and as a viewer, I'm put in the position to feel like I am part of this family. And that's what I was most like impressed with. Like you are welcomed into almost like how we refer to Tevi at a call back to um, to Fiddler on the Roof. Like you're welcome into this family through through Dirk's eyes, but 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 because of the direction where the camera is placed and how you, and you interact with characters through the camera really places you as part of this family. So it, it feels, you feel very connected to the story based on the direction, outside of the performances, outside of, outside of everything else. Uh, so I thought that was, I was like, wow, that, that was, it was very, very strong and very present. I was, I was really blown away with that aspect of the film. 
with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, who, as I've mentioned, I think is probably the greatest living director. As his career continues, and I really enjoy slash love most of his films, not all, but most, it makes me love Boogie Nights even more because it feels like, it feels like he's still learning because he's trying everything. And I just love and respect that uh, so much. And I think that there's an, uh, that adds a certain energy to this film that is, that just kind of slowly disappears <laughs> over the course of his career. I mean, his, his movies were Heart Eight, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, uh, There Will Be Blood, uh, The Master, Inherent Vice, and then Phantom Thread a couple of years ago. And those movies, as a, as a, as a very general statement, Inherent Vice is sort of the exception because it's a, it's a comedy, supposedly, <laughs> uh, from several years ago. They, they get more and more serious. I mean, his films are very serious. Uh, whereas um, uh, Boogie Nights is not a serious film, though there, I think I would say it's not a solely a serious film though there are very real uh, emotional uh, stakes and moments in the film, and it is sort of a, I guess, a drama first and foremost, but it is, there's so much comedy. And I really love to see that element of Paul Thomas Anderson's uh, repertoire because he, he kind of really gets away from that. And I feel like while I love, like Phantom Threads, his most recent film, I love Phantom Thread. Uh, there Will Be Blood is one of my all-time favorites. I think that's one of the best films of all time. I feel like you can feel him starting to take himself more and more seriously as his career goes on. Whereas with Boogie Nights, it's like, shoot your shot, man. Have a good time. Let's make some jokes. Let's make a movie about porn. Let's do all the shots you want to do. And uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to see more of his comedic side. I, it's actually something I wanted to bring up, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great segue. I was wondering, I was going to ask you how much intentional comedy is there in this film? Because I did find myself laughing a lot. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to say like a lot, but there was a lot of humorous parts, I'll say. Like they made me chuckle or smile or, yeah. you know, just give a little wink and a nod sort of thing. My favorite, my favorite <laughs> thing by far in the film <laughs> was when Don Cheadle is alone at the New Year's party and they just, they, when he's clearly trying to develop his look and they just cut to him and he's sort of in that Rick James outfit and he looks so sad and so like disparaged and he looks silly because of what he's wearing. Like I, like, I assume that that was intentional comedy, but there's so many other little moments, little beats like, like that, that where you just chuckle. I mean, all of the, the action film stuff to me is like, is this, are they making fun of this? Or like, are they, is this being oh, yeah. satirical? But it just doesn't, the movie itself doesn't feel that way. It doesn't play like a comedy. So I was curious how much of it is really like intentionally poking fun at some of these things and like really consciously making a joke or is it sort of just accidental humor that, that myself or other people just may be finding some humor within it? No, I, I think it's 100% it's, it's very intentional. I think that that's, that's what makes this movie so darkly humorous throughout. Because, I mean, I laugh almost the whole time. I mean, there are obviously scenes that are not funny. But throughout most of it, uh, and certainly almost the entirety of the first half, it's so funny throughout because, and I think this is really ingenious, is that it's funny indirectly. The humor comes from the fact that the characters don't realize that they're all... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to soberly generalize, but because they, they're all kind of pieces of shit. Like they're, they're, most of the characters are not like traditionally great people or very smart people. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite moments of the film, is Burt Reynolds as Jack Horner, like openly almost weeping about how good that that porn, the new movie is with with uh, Chest and Rock, <laughs> Chest and Brock as they're, you know, as they, they wrap up and they do the nunchucks, like, yeah, fucking, we'll find Rico next time. And he's like, This is the best work we've ever done. I mean, it's a real film, Jack. It feels good. He's got tears in his eyes. And I love that scene because it's simultaneously uh, touching that this man is having this moment, but also hilarious because he's supposed to be like the smartest uh, father figure of the whole thing and he's like this fucking movie rules and we just watched it it's awful like like 
and so I just think all of them are in are either ignorant or consciously in denial to the fact that their their lives are not great and they, they don't have a lot to bring to the table uh, intellectually or almost otherwise. And that causes all of the humor in the film. I mean, everything John C. Riley does, I think, to a to a note, is overt comedy. That's fine with me. I'll find something else to do. I'll fuck on my own time. You know, I got other interests. I'm a magician. The whole thing, I think, is very intentionally funny until we get to the the depths of the '80s. Yeah, the '80s. <laughs> we'll just generalize yeah. the '80s. I mean, the, the, that's the most charming part of the film, is that. That, that this group of people have like come together to form their own niche. Like it's a, it's a bunch of sort of outcasts that yeah. come together and form this, you know, non-traditional family. And that, that's, yeah. to me, that's, that's endearing and charming and something that you want to root for. You know, people who don't feel like they have a place in this world find a place in this world because of each other. Yeah, that's what I like. That that's the strongest, you know. Family is the strongest theme of this film, in my humble opinion. It is. It is, it is and it's so fucked up because their family dynamic is so incestuous, literally, right, and, and strange. <laughs> yes. But that is the whole key, and I really took note. You know, I've watched this movie a hundred, hundreds of times, and just today thinking about how they really, he really goes out of his way early on in the film to establish that these people don't fit in anywhere else. Right. Like uh, Don Cheadle can't keep a job at a regular place because he's, because, you know, for all these different reasons, he's weird. Uh, uh, Heather Graham can't stay in school because people think she's a slut or they, you know, well, the guy's doing the thing. Uh, or just wh- whatever. There's, none of these people work in their daily, in the way, in our world. Right. You know what I mean? Like in our daily, normal, non-porn life. But that's the beauty of the, of the film is that they find such happiness together. Like you said, they find purpose. They find success. Uh, they find family. Right. And they all clearly don't have that in a traditional sense. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's the best part of the film. Emotionally, I should say. It's the best part of the film emotionally. Uh, that part I enjoyed. First, before I dive into my uh, trusty notebook, what uh, I guess I'll ask you what you didn't like about it. There wasn't, to be honest, there wasn't anything I, I didn't like about it. Like there was Perfect. nothing. Perfect. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> there was nothing that jumps out to me. Go. Uh, that wasn't. That wasn't good. Um, I. It may feel a little nitpicky. The one thing I didn't understand. It feels like the emotional rock bottom moment for everybody is the moment. Uh, the cross cutting between. Dirk in the car with that with that other guy and he's masturbating and uh, and roller girl while they try and pick up when they do the you know the pick up a random guy and he had, they have sex or whatever and they're going back the and forth. Bus. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I don't know what that is. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, did <laughs> yeah. I just make that up? <laughs> um, well, they're doing that. Um, <laughs> So that, that, that felt like clearly the emotional rock bottom, especially because they, he mentions it right in the beginning to Burt Reynolds. He goes, before they even get into really conversation about one another, Dur- uh, you know, Mark Wahlberg's like, Well, if you just want to see me jack off, it's 10. But if you just want to look at it, it's only five. So he's really come like full circle in a negative way at that moment. And then he gets beat up by people who are homophobic, apparently, or whatever. That feels like the real rock bottom. They should have, in my opinion, should have flipped the scenes with the robbery and the guns and the, where the guys get shot, where that other guy gets shot. And the, like that feels like that should have come before because one would have informed the other. If they needed money, they're running out of money, like clearly the record label thing doesn't work out. Then they go and they, they come up with this harebrained scheme to make five grand or whatever. That goes horribly wrong. And now he's left with going back to square one and then that doesn't work out, it gets jumped. Like, that feels like the, the bottom of the pit. Well, I think, um, the, what I'll say is, I think it, 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 is, it is clearly a, a different choice in terms of film structure to kind of add that last scene on. And I, I, I obviously don't know why it was chosen to do, be like that. I think it's interesting in its uniqueness 
in its, uh, the, the unusualness of that structure. And I also think it's never bothered me at all because that last scene is so iconic and so incredible. The Alfred Molina and the firecrackers and, oh, that's Cosmo, he's Chinese. That, that whole scene is, is just, yeah, it's, it's a special, It's a crazy scene. scene. <laughs> uh, but what, I, what I, I guess in my, in defense, I would say the thing I, I love about that scene more than any other part is that long shot of just Wahlberg's face as he's sitting on the couch and it goes on for 30 seconds. That's just him having thoughts. And, 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 and that to me, and I, I said this to my girlfriend as we were watching just now, I, I said, that's his bottom. So even though we just watched him go through what you would think would be the lowest thing ever, uh, and it was, when he was, he's jerking off, he gets beat up by these guys and it's, it's all bad. It couldn't be more shameful. Uh, that still wasn't enough for him to realize. Like it, it, it took, it took another layer down, but he like snapped to sobriety almost while sitting in this guy's living room. That's fucking crazy. And there's guys with guns and there's a Chinese pool boy lighting off firecrackers and there's drugs everywhere. And, and he's sweating and everyone, like, it's just the most intense scene. And he just goes through it and has that realization then. Like it took that extra bit, which you could disagree with structurally, but I think is probably to some degree realistic in the sense that just because that should be any normal person's bottom, uh, getting beaten up for masturbating uh, in a f- fucking parking lot, uh, doesn't mean it's an addict's bottom. You know, it can always get worse. And for whatever reason, he needed that next, like, holy shit, where am I? <laughs> yeah. Like, wh- what has my life become? You know? Yeah, I mean, they're 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 both <laughs> like in reality, they're 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 equally shitty, but from like from the film standpoint, I just it, it feels like it's a full circle sort of moment. You 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 see him start in one place and you see him sort of end in the same place. Uh, it can go either way. It just it just jumps out to me as like oh, it, it just feels very poetic the way that I'm thinking of it. I, I did think of you, uh, I didn't realize it because I've heard you say this many times, there's shadows in life, baby. When, <laughs> <laughs> whenever making a film with Everett, there's like harsh shadows that shouldn't be there. <laughs> oh, there's shadows in life, Keith, shut up. Shadows in life, baby, yeah. what are we doing here? Yeah, what are we doing? Hit record, let's fucking go. <laughs> what, do, what do you think about uh, seeing his dick at the end of the movie? It's, it's the only reason I watched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Makes it all worth it. Uh, I, I'll, I'll answer that in a little bit of a broader statement. I think there is obviously a lot of sex and, and nudity in the film, but I was so pleased, if that's, I, pleased is probably the right word, with how it was handled. It didn't, it didn't feel gratuitous. It didn't, it didn't feel over-sexualized for the sake of being sexy. Like it, it was what it was, and it, it was it 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 wasn't overdone. Where I feel like a lot, like now, it's like we're gonna show sex scenes, and people are gonna be moaning and screaming and titties bouncing. It's like just to really assault your senses, and and then people you know gravitate towards towards that shit. Um, where this felt, everything felt very purposeful, and again, it comes back to the directing for me. Yeah. But uh, so. So I love, getting back to your actual question, I, I, I really liked seeing it at the end because it, it's, it's this holy grail. It, it's weird to even sort of say that out loud. It's more beautiful than I'd ever imagined. But like, the, the movie treats this penis <laughs> like the, the, the holy grail. This is the thing that can cure cancer if we just let it. You know, it's treated like with such mystique in this world and then to the yeah. viewer it's it's hidden the whole film so you never so it's like a mystery for you and then finally getting a sort of a look at that last shot and that sort of a, a redemption moment for him it, it 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 hits so much harder like if you saw it in the first five minutes of the film it, it pun intended you'd blow your load you know like it just it just it, it doesn't feel as powerful and as impactful it, Everything in that film worked together for that moment, and I loved it. So I, so I liked it from a filmmaking standpoint, and then I loved it from a penis standpoint. 
Yeah, <laughs> from just a yeah, <laughs> just a sheer um, penis. <laughs> I love what I something I've thought about with this film is it doesn't leave me wanting for anything, which is such a rare thing in a movie. Almost yeah. always when I wrap up a, a movie, I'm watching a movie, especially a movie that's got fucking 16 storylines. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. crazy. There there's nothing that feels loose. Mm-hmm. Like it was like it was just the kind of loosely patched up. Everything that is set up is paid off. Mm-hmm. And that is that takes so much work in the writing and the directing. Uh and and it's just like great directors mess that up mm-hmm. where you're just like, "Oh, that little thing would have been nice." Like I can't think of a single thing that I wish I had a little more closure on mm-hmm. or a little more detail on. Um, and that's one of the things I love so much about that final shot is that because of the way the movie builds, particularly through the first half or what have you in the 70s when everything's happy, it's his, his dick is always kind of being teased. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, it, it, the, all the people looking when he first pulls it out mm-hmm. and all the women like gasping and the colonel's face is so funny at the pool party where he asks them to pull it out and then just goes... Thank you, and just like stares, like <laughs> like why not? Like he's he's like shocked uh, to his core. Yeah. Uh, and there's you know there's shots of his bulge and all that stuff. But then in the sort of the second half, the dark part of the film, it sta- it steers away from that enough where that's not a focal point. Where mm-hmm. where we're not we're not as the audience we're not thinking about how big he is all the time. We're just thinking about these characters that we know. And then so at the end, to remember that it's built you up for the first half, and now we're just gonna surprise you and go full frontal male dong, which doesn't happen that often in a movie, is really genius. And so it's it's funny to, to look at a scene where this guy pulls out this giant penis and you're like, this is brilliant, brilliant filmmaking. But it really <laughs> is in the sense of uh, closing all, you know, knotting all loose ends. Yeah. This this is the house that, that, that he built, you know? It just, yeah. it, it's, it's poetic is the word that comes to me when I think about this movie for the most part. It's it's a very yeah. poetic film, and even that part feels poetic to me. Yeah, and to your other point about the sexuality not being uh, super uh, over the top, while some people probably watch this movie and be like, "What? Like, there's sex throughout? How could you say that?" Yeah. But what you're saying, which I agree with completely, is that everything is so intentional and purposeful. Uh, even the more gratuitous scenes, like the scene where he first has sex uh, on film with Julianne Moore. That's probably the longest. I mean, that is the longest, most graphic sex scene. But it's it's not overtly sexy. It's right. certainly not sexualized. Correct. It's very uh, intimate, and but almost in an awkward way. Yep. Uh, and it's very uh, clinical, almost. Mm-hmm. Where it's, it's like you're there and it's shot all really up close. And you just kind of see skin and their faces and... She's moaning and and they and he's trying really hard and it's just like the and the way that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson you know shows shows them in the frame like the literal like within the lens within the the, the film spooling uh, is just is just really brilliant and I think that that was it's a great example of this movie not just being like let's let's see some titties let's let's get yeah, really there's none of that like there's there's yeah. none of that and i'm and i'm really impressed by it cuz it's a, it's a cheap easy sort of thing to do to just grab people to make it memorable to make it stand out it's a it's a yeah it feel and in in that scene in particular it's very uh, business like it's 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 i think is one of the closer scenes i can't think of another scene that that shows what it's like to 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 be in an intimate scene on a film set when there's when there's not that romance in the air and there's not that lust in the yeah. air you know like it's it's completely different for those who are not involved in filmmaking like when you're when you're on set it's it's uh, obviously it's fake <laughs> yeah. so it's there is a sense of awkwardness to it and there is a sense of like oh are you okay with this how do you feel about that like <laughs> yeah. there's that awkward yeah. conversation that that they're having you know that that's a real thing yeah that's a funny point i i think i've acted in one sex scene, maybe two. That I mean, they were played for laughs mostly, so it wasn't like a, a totally real thing. I'm not sticking my thumb in her ass. Get off. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't laugh. Are you want me to hold it longer than that? Yeah. Just like... And then I helped direct a, a, a independent film I wrote years ago, where there was like a pretty 
like I would say like super graphic but like pretty graphic sex scene and it's so funny because in your mind you like you're saying everyone thinks like oh man like that's sex scene like it's that's really it's like no it's the most awkward yeah, thing yeah it's, it's like, not fun there is, there is, <laughs> it's it is not, not sexy <laughs> like yeah. it was just all of us like these these you know the performers on the bed and and all the, all of us that are like holding boom mics and stuff are just like, mm. like yeah, just yeah, like away you just you just, shouldn't. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it feels like I'm I'm in, I'm intruding. Yes. I'm intruding. Yeah, it feels <laughs> everyone's personal space is is just not yeah. is invaded. It's just not good yeah. for anybody on in the crew, not just the actors too. It's just it's yeah. tough. Was there any standouts from a performance standpoint for you? Yes, I the. I thought the performances on a on, again everything about this movie I think is is just good. It's just good. <laughs> but the person I enjoyed the most and I believed the most and I felt the most was Burt Reynolds. I liked Burt Reynolds the most. Yeah. I don't know why maybe because he's a filmmaker and I hope to one day make films and uh, like uh, maybe that's why I connected with him more and I'm trying to think about it as we started inward looking inward why do I like these things? But he just felt so authentic, and and I I believed him. I believed that he had that clout. I believed that he was from that era. I believed that he had that uh, bravado. I like I just believed in everything he was doing. And when they're in the diner, and yeah. he's selling him on what his dreams are, I love that scene. I love that that it's like a monologue, really. I mean, he just opens up about like his goals and what he wants. He wants to make a masterpiece. He wants to make a real film that people can remember him by. Like he wants to be taken seriously for his art. And as this an is, artist, yeah. As an artist. And this is the genre that he has the opportunity to show his art. His performance, I thought, was was really, really well done. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he, he's, he's probably the best part acting-wise. I was really sad to read that uh, he had a miserable experience and doesn't think the film is good. I'm told that you were so uncomfortable about making the movie that after the movie was done, before you had even seen it, you wanted to hit the director, Paul Thomas Anderson. You wanted to hit him in the face. Uh, no, I didn't want to hit him in the face. I just wanted to hit him. <laughs> <laughs> it's not entirely unlike, I don't think we covered this in the episode, but Gene Hackman like was an asshole and didn't like working on Royal Tenenbaums, and he creates one of the best characters of his, of his life, and I feel like that's with Burt Reynolds here. Is like, what else was Burt Reynolds doing in 1996-97? Why are you all shiny? It's Vaseline. No one was trying to get Burt Reynolds and stuff. He got nominated for an Oscar here. He won a Golden Globe for this role. Uh, but he's like, didn't like Paul Thomas Anderson, thought he was a cocky kid who thought he knew everything, and they came to blows. Uh, Burt Reynolds attacked him on the set, like was punching him. Wow. Uh, and I just say, I, I, I'm blown away by... Uh, with both of those examples, Burt Reynolds here and, and Gene Hackman and Royal Tenenbaums, how how do you even keep making the movie? Yeah, how do you make the movie at that point? An all-time great character. Yeah. <laughs> like I just don't see like they're professionals. I guess is the only way to say it is yeah, we, we move on. But I mean, to, to you, I think of acting as you have to be in this headspace and you have to be comfortable and you have to feel good and you have to. But you know, they they're proving that you don't. I yeah. guess it's it's fascinating. Well, art imitating life. I mean, that scene where where Mark Wahlberg blows up and yeah. he fights I'm him. I'm the fucking king of I'm dirt. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm really fascinated by uh, Mark Wahlberg because I think he's phenomenal in this movie. I think he does such a good job. And I, I long for Mark Wahlberg being a different person who goes down a different career path. Because <laughs> I feel like this is such an interesting role that he gets to do so much like fun work in and he doesn't he's a couple scenes he's a little shaky but for the most part it's really good and i really buy his like wide-eyed optimistic naive persona in the beginning he's so kind to everyone he's so happy to meet everyone mm -hmm. he's so polite and respectful and then he immediately switches in the 80s and she's doing that documentary on him and he's all coked out and is like to all the critics out there you know i know they're going to be reviewing this and i know they're going to try to knock me I just want them to know. Is it okay if I say this into camera, Amber? All that stuff is so funny. Um, but I, I, then I went through his IMDb and I thought uh, he did Three Kings, which is a movie I really like, uh, that I think he plays an interesting character. And then he did I Heart Huckabees, which is a comedy that he's hilarious in. And uh, The Other Guys, years later, is another comedy that he's really funny in. I love And almost all guys. of his other movies, while I like some of them, I'm not trying to hate on his career, but they don't, 
They're not like challenging roles. They're just Mark Wahlberg movies. Yeah. He, the, the comparison I have is like, he is the Adam Sandler of action movies. Yeah. Where it's like, this is what I do. Everyone likes it. Yeah. I'm not going to try anything interesting. And that's just what he's done now for 15 years. And that makes me sad because I think he, he has a lot of talent. Yeah, that's that's not to, again, yeah, pick apart his career, but it, that's it, it seems like he got to, to a certain point and he's like, I just want to do cool action movies where I'm a, a stud, you know, or I'm funny. America. Yeah, like yeah. America, I do cool action stuff, I save the day, or I'm kind of funny and I'm cool still. Like, yeah. Julianne Moore. Yes. Great actress or... Overrated actress. That's tough. I uh, could she be both? That's a question. I I want to say she is like somewhat appropriately ranked. I don't I don't I think she's very talented. I love her in um, The Big Lebowski. I think she's great in that. Uh, like, she's so, phenomenal. Like, where do you think she is? I, I feel like she's appropriately rated. I guess that would be my short answer. That was kind of a mis- misleading question. Because uh, I think she's very, very good. I think she's phenomenal in this movie. I think sometimes her, her reputation is that she might kind of crank it up a little too much sometimes. Mm-hmm. A little, little bit of overacting here and there. But uh, I think she's very, very good. And I, and I love her performance in this movie. Oh Yeah, I think she's excellent in the film. I, I think everybody is... I don't think there's a bad performance in the film, to be honest with you. I don't, I yeah. don't think there's a bad performance. I think Burt Reynolds is the best, and I, and I really, really like Don Cheadle. I think Don Cheadle is such a good actor. I, I like Don Cheadle in mostly everything he does, personally. Yeah. And I think he is an underrated comedic actor. Like, I thought he was so yeah. funny in this movie. <laughs> like, I, he was one of my favorite characters. I loved his story. I loved every. I loved everything that not everything that happened to him, but I love that bank scene. That bank scene is like heartbreaking, yeah, and and like raw and like I I just I felt it. I felt his performance. I thought that I just thought he was great. I, I think everybody yeah. is really good in the film, but I guess those two really stand out to me. Yeah, we talked about uh, JFK and what an amazing cast it has, but I feel like this movie almost has that same level because those people all became like. You, if you have Philip Seymour Hoffman as, as your 18th lead, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, like, it's yeah. incredible. And yeah. he's so good. My God. Scotty is, I mean, he's obviously such a great actor. Timeless, yeah. timeless, timeless. But uh, but his little nuances to that character are really something else. I love the, he's biting the clipboard in that mm-hmm. scene. He's like chewing on the pencil. Mm-hmm. And he's just so infatuated. And, and then that scene, he, he, he points Dirk to go down the stairs. So you lead, and then he passes him on the narrow stairs to get like, it's so funny. This movie just doesn't have any misses. Like every scene is so well well put together, well directed, well intentioned. There's nothing that, it, at two and a half hours, to me, there's nothing that feels fat. Like there's nothing that feels like, oh, this is kind of dragging, which I think is really remarkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, because, because there's just so a, many stories to get through. Yeah, you know, but it, all interesting. Yeah. I mean, the scene in the donut shop with Don Cheadle is so, like, out of nowhere and is almost a, a completely different feel from the rest of the movie, but it fits. And I think that that's remarkable. I mean, Don Cheadle is your eighth lead, and he gets a whole uh, 12 minutes there to go into a donut shop and be a part of a shootout. All right, motherfucker, empty the cash register now, motherfucker, and hurry up. So this film shut out at the Academy Awards. Nominated for three, won none. Mm-hmm. What was it nominated I, for? It was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, mm-hmm. which it lost to a couple kids from Boston. And, and everybody back in and, Boston watching us tonight. And thank you so much, the city of Boston. And, 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 and God, I know we're forgetting somebody. Whoever we forgot, we love you. And we, we love thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then Burt Reynolds was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. And Julian, Julianne Moore was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, both of whom did not win. Um, this was the 1998 Oscars for the films that came out in 97. Which, you re- which was a year that you may remember included a little film called Titanic. So... Mm-hmm. Titanic obviously won Best Picture. But then I looked at the other nominees, which were As Good As It Gets, Mm -hmm. 
uh, Goodwill Hunting, L.A. Confidential, and The Full Monty. And I feel like there's a couple that could come off of that list. Uh, the, I, I don't understand, because it's the same thing in the Best Director category. Paul Thomas Anderson, not nominated. And you had the directors of Titanic, L.A. Confidential, Goodwill Hunting, The Full Monty, and a movie called The Sweet Hereafter, which I, I don't recall ever even knowing anything about. Yeah. Um, I don't know why The Full Monty was such a big deal. Yeah, The Full Monty, I remember it being a big deal. It's a comedy, right? Is, is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a British comedy about like five kind of down on their luck middle-aged dudes who become like a stripper troupe. Yeah, that's, yes, because they, yes. That's all I remember like, about that film. Yeah, it was funny, but it's like the kind of thing that like, your 70 year old aunt really liked like it's like oh it's british humor and it's just safe enough that yeah. no one gets too upset and it's you know these guys they're funny it's like how the fuck how the fuck is that nominated yeah so i'm just sad i'm sad uh, that and Good. i wonder <laughs> if, if the academy just didn't know what to make of boogie nights you got this 26 year old like wonder kid coming out making this movie and uh, it's about sex and yeah, all that stuff. I feel like uh, success happens late, like uh, like that that type of success happens after it's known. You know, like well, all my argument to that is Paul Thomas Anderson has yet to win an Academy Award, uh, which is uh, sure, which is really invalidates the Academy Awards. <laughs> Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, R. has R. more Oscars yeah, sure than does. Paul Thomas Anderson. 3-6 yeah. uh, Mafia has more Oscars. Once again, our families, Ludacris, Shotty, what's up? Going down, up, man. Man. George Clooney, my favorite man, he showed me love when I first met him. Ten, we bring the house. We out of here. Yeah. Well deserved, though. Yeah. Can't argue with that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pimpin' ain't easy, easy or whatever. Oh. <laughs> Say what? Uh, pimping ain't easy or uh, pimping. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hustle it's and flow. Hard, hard for a pimp. Hard out here for That's a pimp. That's what it is. Yeah. Trying to make this money for the rent. All the Cadillac and gas money spent. Got a whole lot of bitches talking shit. Something like that. Yeah, that's about right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oscar. Oscar. <laughs> That's number one, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for sticking it out on my list. Uh, we got new stuff coming, and uh, but we got first we got to get through this. Ugh, it's gonna be rough. <laughs>